Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Peach Pie Podcast. I'm Peach Pie, joined by Scott Turner and Buzz Brockway. Yo. Go dogs. Good evening. Go dogs. Say it, Buzz. Say it. Yeah, Buzz. I can't, I can't say that. Come on. I can't Come say on, that. Come on, Buzz. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. You pansy. Just say the words, man. Come on. Come on. Big day for Dog Nation. Are you kidding which... me? Look, I mean, do you see what's hanging right there? No. You see what's on my chest right now? <laughs> I'm happy for all of my friends who are happy. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'll have to. T- well, I guess... that's, that's a very political way of saying things. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I... Some of my friends are happy. Some of my friends are sad, and I'm for my friends. Exactly. All, all I can say is Alabama fans are shedding tears, and I'm here for it. <laughs> And because I, I watched, I watched the Paul Feinbaum show yesterday, and I was dying at some of these callers who were calling in. It's like George, George, was Paul did, Feinbaum George, crying. He Feinbaum was probably crying too. And he, no, he was. He seemed excited about George, but some of these Alabama fans were calling. He's like George, Georgia didn't beat us. We beat them. We beat them. If you look at the two games this year, we scored more points than they did. <laughs> that's that's Alabama math at its finest, yeah. right there. Yeah, but we won. We Alabama won, math. We won the last. We won the last game. And, uh, you know, nine to six going into the, into halftime, you, you thought it was gonna be a game of field goals. It was a game of defense mm-hmm. at that point in time. And, and, uh, you know, Georgia had given, had had a couple good plays, uh, they given up a couple plays to Alabama. Uh, and, you know, it looked like it was going to be uh touch and go, but I, I was, I was, t- uh, texting with some friends during the game. Georgia's I said, Georgia's a second half team. Um, we always make adjustments, adjustments at halftime. They came out their quarter, started playing better. So the off, I mean, cause there were times during the first half where they did not know what they were doing. It looked like some of those offsides or uh, false start calls were bad. Um, and, uh, but that fourth quarter. Yeah. There were a lot of, a lot of penalties in the first half. Yep. Yeah. Delay of game. I think we had two, de- one or two delay of game penalties. We had, um, you know, you know, and the, the one thing I got to say, um, we won in, in spite of some really bad officiating um, because that one, that one fumble uh, wasn't really a fumble. And uh, ACC refs, I'll point out. Yeah, I know. They must. Well, now you got now the, the world has experienced what we've been suffering with for yeah. low these many years. Buzz and I both are ACC team fans and <laughs> we, all we can do is throw ourselves at your mercy about the officiating. This is what we deal with week in and week out during college football season. But at, with a nine to six start to the first half, you know, no scoring really of any consequence until, until five or six minutes left in the first quarter. And then with that type of, of score, it, it, a lot of people would think, Oh, this is a boring game for me. It built like this sense of tension. Like yes. the longer the game went and the score mm-hmm. was, was so incredibly close and low. It was like, Oh my gosh, who's going to make the mistake. Who's going to, you know, and it's like, as I'm watching, I'm, I'm getting more and more. And I'm not even a UGA fan, like as my number one team, I, I'll go to a game. I enjoy supporting the dogs uh, whenever they're not playing Florida state, which is pretty much all the time. But I, I just kept getting more nervous and more nervous. And I could sense like even through online communications with my friends who are died in the wool, die in the wool Georgia fans, they're just getting more and more. And I kept checking, like, how you guys do it? How y'all do it? You know, <laughs> it's like, we're fine over here, you know, sweating or whatever. <laughs> um, no, I had, I had, I had, I, I, had a fr- I had a friend of mine who's a, who's a chief of staff for a, for a, a Senator who was texting me. He's like, He's what did he say? He's like, how are you doing over there? Or something like that. I'm just like, I, I have never been this nervous in my entire life. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like I, I, like my, my old boss was, my old boss was texting me. He was, he was just saying, you know, go dogs. He's like, please be, please be Alabama. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I was texting with my friend, Holly Harris during the game. It was, you know, she, her son was decked out in Georgia Bulldogs gear. Uh, you know, and it was, uh, you know, the, oh, you mean the kid who came to Georgia dressed in Kentucky gear was that's, not wearing, that's, that's okay. Right. I just that's want to make right. sure it's the same kid. <laughs> that's, that's right. I mean, they, in fairness, they, they live in Lexington, but well, that's but, fine. But, but I mean, but, 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 but no, I mean, it was, it, it was, uh, you know, I, I think I got more congratulations. I think more people texted me last night to say congrats on Georgia winning than texts I got on my birthday. <laughs> Well, that's because your birthday's on Christmas. That's, and I mean, you kind of, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're upstaged by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can't help you there. <laughs> so, but did you, did, you know, what are the, uh, what are the other things though, uh, regarding, 
the game that I, I just found absolutely fascinating. And, and I, I am no Nick Saban fan. But the way he handled the post game, going over, smiling and congratulating warmly, Kirby Smart, his former assistant, and then standing up for his two guys mm-hmm. who were basically there blaming the, you know, I, listen, I'm a Dolphins fan as well. I hate Nick Saban for what he did to my franchise. Like <laughs> the, before he, he even be, went to Alabama and started winning all these national championships, I, I will never forgive him for picking Dante Culpepper over Drew Brees. <laughs> Like, I mean, that's just, I hope he goes to a special corner of hell just for that decision and then bailing on the team uh, to go to Alabama. So I I still harbor a little bit of anger towards Nick Saban for that, but I got to admit, I mean, come on, man. Well done as a coach, as a man, growing men in your program. Uh, Proud of him for that. Yeah, it was, it was a good game. Go ahead. I think we have, we have to mention Stetson Bennett. I mean, I think that sequence there, Jason, you mentioned the questionable fumble call. That was a crucial point in the game because all of a sudden, Bama took the lead. It's late in the game, and you're thinking, "Oh man, is this is this when Bama's going to go on their run and shut things down?" But next series, Bennett comes back, makes a huge touchdown throw, and uh, puts the dogs back back in the lead. So, I mean, that was a walk on, <laughs> and with all those four and five star recruits. Other quarterbacks stand there holding clipboards. There's Stetson Bennett, the walk-on, leading them to a national championship. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And with the Georgia Bulldogs winning a national championship in the same season year as the World Series champion Atlanta Braves, can we put to arrest this concept, this ridiculous concept, that there's been a sports curse in the city of Atlanta? And and Georgia Tech winning the ACC championship in basketball okay well, well okay i would put united atlanta yeah, united's that, major league soccer title over yes over georgia tech but you know we have championships here multiple yeah. and two of the major ones in the first in, in within the last five months can we can we can we recognize that there's no such thing as a curse in sports yep tell that to Jason, so moved tell that to the chicago cubs man it was a hundred years <laughs> that's because that's Chicago's problem, but the reason our- the reason why they didn't win a world a series in, in chicago is because they sucked not because there was a curse <laughs> I'm, I, I'm 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 just teasing yes of course i, 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 I <laughs> well, well thank you for admitting that the bulldogs sucked for 41 years i appreciate we didn't yeah. suck we didn't suck for 41 the years there, but i mean i got uh, one, one, more, one more go ahead buzz sorry one more thing to mention so fanatics uh axios reports that fanatics the sports gear place says they have sold more stuff in 24 hours than they did in 30 days of Alabama gear last year. So dog fans are snapping this stuff up at a historic rate. I bought I bought everything I bought uh, within 15 minutes after the game. <laughs> <laughs> like I was I was like looking through stuff as quickly as I could trying to buy get get the shirts uh, and, the, and the jacket I wanted. And then the next day I spent money via the AJC for the because I got the Braves like acrylic paper newspaper thing and so i got the same thing for georgia uh but the, what i was gonna uh, what i was gonna say a second ago because you know this was the fourth time we played alabama going into the fourth quarter w- in a close in a close game mm-hmm. and um you know i was i remember the 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 sec champion or yeah sec championship in in 2012 was that was my first weekend in washington dc when i started working in dc and just being, you know, watching Chris Conley fall three, three to five yards short of a touchdown to win the game and basically the de facto national championship. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, in, in uh, beginning of 2018, drunkenly yelling inside the Capitol Hill Club at Karen Handel's uh, uh, <laughs> of, uh, of a party to watch the game, uh, you know, when Georgia lost that game in, in overtime uh, and then the, the SEC championship, I think the next year, you know, it was it was frustrating. Um but you know, here we are. Finally, finally have a, a national championship uh, after 41 years. So, anyway, I, I would bet money, you know, uh, that UGA will have another championship before 41 years. From I now. hope, so. God, I hope so. And the <laughs> the the last thing I'll mention, the last thing I'll mention before before we move on, how cool was it seeing Ben Stooley and Kirby Smart on the field together? It was yeah. a nice bookend. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was it was a really nice bookend. Uh, so. In other news, uh, in, in political news, 
the Georgia General Assembly got underway on Monday. Of course, it wasn't a real session day because of the because of the national championship game. Uh, so the first real first real day of session was today, which was uh, day number two. Yeah, hide your wives, hide your wallets. The the General Assembly is back in session. <laughs> That's right. They're they're in session. Uh, they're, they're they're in session. They're going to be out of session next week which uh, Scott informed me via phone earlier today is the first time they've done that in quite some time. Uh, but uh, so it looks like it's going to be a longer session than it has been uh, in, in recent years. Uh, Cause they've been getting out what end of, with the exception of 2020, they've been getting out, you know, pretty before like April 1st or just after. Uh, April right 1st. around. Yeah. Right around the end of March. First, first of April has been typically uh, if they want to meet that this time, cause they, they got sort of a medium start, you know, January 10th, is not the latest you can start. January fourteenth would be the latest, but it's sort of a late start. They in the in years recent years they have always burned session days during what are called budget hearing days, um, but they've decided to have their budget hearing days on scheduled off days, so they're not burning legislative days. Those would be committee days, and so that will push the end of session out unless they do five day weeks. And nobody in the legislature likes five day weeks. <laughs> nobody. That gets exhausting. Uh, it gets absolutely because they're 12 hour days when you're in the legislature. So working 60 hours a week away from your home and family can get brutal um, when you're doing five. But, it, you know, the, the legislature in, in any statewide office cannot raise money while the legislature is in session. So stretching it out has this consequence, whether intended or not, that people who are in office today cannot raise money to defend themselves against whatever is coming down the pike. Yep. So that's why, especially in the second year of biennium, you usually see the accelerator press. That's why you do see five day weeks. That's why you do see the legislature meeting while they're doing budget hearings. Yeah. That's just not the case. Uh, they've taken next week off. And the, and the primary primary, uh, what May 24th, something like that. May 24th. May. Yep. Set in yeah, stone. You could May have, 24th. If this, yeah. If it extends into April, first or second week of April, you could have, five weeks you know them uh, uh getting out so, uh, adjourning sunny die and having five weeks before the primary yep and so wh what what early observations do you guys have uh because i mean I, I i follow some limited stuff at the state level uh most of my uh daily uh efforts are focused at the uh at, at the federal level <clears throat> uh, the vast majority of my daily efforts are focused at the federal level so i mean i realize it's only day two but what early observations do do each of you have about what's where things are heading this session buzz you first well i think you know themes that have been talked about before will be um will come true i think they're, they're gonna the crime and education are going to be big issues this year um and, I, and it, it, I think what'll be interesting to see to me is uh governor kemp you know obviously locked in a tight tough primary but he's got this legislative session. I think he announced uh, he, there's going to be some rebates, some uh, tax, some, some tax, uh, some money sent back to citizens, uh, things like that. Uh, he's uh, announced you know, something that I was very excited about. He has some of the uh, gears money left, which is education funds left over from uh, one of the relief package bills. He had about 40, 50 million, somewhere in that range, and he's doled out some stuff. Uh, teachers are going to get some money to help cover school supplies, which has always boggled my mind. Why why doesn't the school systems pay for school supplies? Uh, they make teachers do it out of their own pockets. So the governor's going to help that. But also uh, something that excites me is uh, five uh, four million dollars, four point one million dollars. <coughs> excuse me, uh, for a charter school replication fund. And uh, in full disclosure, I'm on the state charter school commission, uh, the chair of that commission right now. We were um involved in submitting that application so i'm very ex excited to see that happen we're going to target uh areas where there aren't a lot of charter schools so rural georgia and other parts of uh of the metro area that don't have a lot of charter schools that's where we're that's what we're looking for so scott what you got uh well i i what the words i heard most today were mental health um i i, I heard it from corners of the state uh, representatives and senators who generally you wouldn't think would have a, a major interest in the mental health issue, but apparently the speaker has set that as agenda for the House Majority Caucus, and there is genuine excitement amongst the rank and file members about that. So I think we'll see some mental health initiatives. I don't know what it'll look like yet, 
but it's it's something that's plagued this state ever since the federal government eliminated centralized care for mental health. They they wanted a community care model, which meant that the instead of sending somebody to Milledgeville when they had some issues that needed to get taken care of, they had to be treated within their community. Well, there are facilities throughout the state right now. Um, there are beds for them, but there are not enough trained health, mental health care professionals to deal with the problem. And so what we're seeing is our local county jails are filling up with what are likely mental health cases. My own sheriff here in Cherokee County complained to that about that to me while I was in the legislature, that he has basically become the mental health ward for Cherokee County. Mm -hmm. And so to see some real substantive conservative led legislation on an issue would be exciting and keep an eye out for it. But we, you know, we see also a lot of red meat. It is an election year. Constitutional carry we talked about last week uh, will be there. Uh, Wes Cantrell is actively trying to get his caucus to embrace school choice. He's pointing to Doug Ducey and some other governors of other states, and he's trying to you know, show how effective they are at maintaining Republican majorities by pushing the school choice issue. Yep. So uh, big ups and big support for Wes in those efforts. Uh, it, this is the time for Republicans to lead on that issue. And it so solves so many thing, problems. On, uh, one, let me finish. Let me finish um, uh, because this is an important point. If you if you support school choice, all these other ancillary issues that are kind of problems today, like CRT or uh, indoctrination, whatever your concern is, school masks. choice is a, masks, whatever, whatever your concern is. Home, uh, being able to take your child and, and put them in the environment that you choose as a parent is a, a long term fix, not just for the problems of today, but for future problems as well. Be Go Bets. But be before Buzz goes, let me just say here the mental, <laughs> mental, the mental health issue is, is one, and I don't know the angle uh, that some of these legislators are taking, but that's that is one that uh, you know has gotten heightened attention because of because of the pandemic, uh, isolation. Uh, anxiety that comes with, uh, you know, a lot of the, the uncertainty we have uh, in, in, you know, the economic climate as well as the political climate. <clears throat> I have no beef or no issue saying this, that, you know, I have my own mental health issues. I suffer from generalized anxiety disorder, which means I have panic attacks. Uh, you know, I've dealt with anxiety my entire life. I've also dealt with depression my entire life. This stuff is real. And I really hope people take pay a lot of attention to it in this legislative session. It's a, it's an important issue. And it's one where we often we often kind of um, uh, equate it with weakness in people, uh, or mm. or, that, or that or there's a defect. There, people are defective who who have mental health issues. It doesn't mean they're crazy. Uh, there was a great uh, when I was at Furnace Fest, a music festival out in Birmingham back in September. There was a T-shirt, and I wound up buying it. And it said uh, the T-shirt just says it's okay not to be okay. Uh, and, and I wish I wish people would be more understanding and, and accepting when it comes to a lot of the mental health issues that we that we face as a society today, because they're more prevalent. And there's not one person alive who doesn't have some sort of issue. Um, and so we all have we all face our we all face demons. It's just it's really important that we we don't stigmatize it. So, Buzz, go ahead. You made the point I was going to make just much better than I could. So here. here. <laughs> and also, I think you're going to say something about school choice because you, you were going to pitch in at that point. I don't know if that stimulates, stimulates your memory or not, but uh, Wes being sort of trying to lead with uh, Doug Ducey and, and yeah. other governors as well. No, it is. I think there's, I mean, you, you nailed it, Scott. There is, there's plenty of data to point to, to show that this is a winning issue for Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but especially if you're, if you're Brian Kemp and the Republicans who are trying to uh, keep this state from turning blue, uh, they should absolutely 110% embrace it and champion it and get it done and uh, pick up the phone and call Wes Cantrell and tell him you're for it. Uh, what, one other thing that um, that Buzz mentioned uh, before we, uh, as part of the agenda tonight, was that uh, Butch Miller has introduced uh, a, a constitutional amendment uh, to require citizens or require voters to be citizens. Uh, which is an interesting issue. Immigration has 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 long been a wedge issue for conservative voters. Uh, this is obviously a, a primary a primary issue. Uh, yeah. <laughs> not surprised. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, this this is not going to have uh, this is not going to have the votes passed the legislature. Considering Georgia uh, Republicans don't have the constitutional majorities that they once had. Um, that that said that said uh, you know a good messaging bill. Uh, <laughs> makes for a really, it makes for a really good messaging bill. 
Of course. No, well, I mean, the, and the messaging will be look at the voting record. I, I fully expect that to get a vote in the Senate for the purpose of holding up those who vote no as examples of just how far left the left has gone. Um, the, the, I, yeah, it's a messaging bill in that we, we know they don't have the votes. Where, but is, where, is it a bad idea? Where, Not, where, where is this a problem in Georgia? I'm curious. It, I mean, it's already against the law. I, I, I think here's my observation about this. It's there's some organization who's pushing this as, as I, if you drive down 80, I-85 heading to Atlanta, close to the uh, 7585 merge, uh, I've three or four times I've seen a billboard saying, you know, demand that only citizens can vote. And I was like, I thought we already had, had done that. But yes, yeah, it's, it's taking, you know, the idea, I suppose, is take it from general law and put it in the Constitution. I, I think you know there there are what's it, some some pretty big city has decided to allow non citizens to vote in their local elections. See, I know. See, I know. Uh, so see, I think I, that stokes the fear that you know that that could happen here. I know. So, I know. San Francisco does it, I believe, and I know Tacoma Park, Maryland, does it, which is like literally like you know ten feet from Washington D.C. Yeah. Um, it, but it's only in local elections. It's not right. In, it's not in uh, statewide elections. It's not in federal elections. Federal, the state has no control over who can vote in, in federal yeah. elections. Uh, the the uh, kind of tangential to this, but not directly. Go ahead, Scott, if you want to. Well, I was going to answer your original question, which is where is this a problem? And and I hate that. I hate that we, we we're trying to to react. I think this is not a reactive piece of legislation or a, pr a reactive proposal. I think it's a proactive one in the event that in the future, uh, a different type of legislature is uh, or a different makeup of our legislature is in power. They could change state law it, if it's a constitutional amendment, in which case it would have to go to the people to be approved via a ballot initiative after it's approved by the General Assembly. If the people vote for it, then you cannot just change the law. It, when the legislature flips to blue, you know, and I think that that's that it's not that it's trying to solve a problem today. It's trying to be proactive about what could become a problem. OK, so, well, if I, one one thing to add. If this puts to bed, because when I was running for secretary of state, I had polling that, that I talked about when I was on the campaign trail all the time. Republicans are convinced and probably even more so now that there are millions and millions and millions of illegally cast votes across this country by people who are not citizens or not properly registered to vote, et cetera, et cetera. If passing this constitutional amendment puts that lie to bed, then let's do it. Okay, so let me let me dive into what I've been wanting to say here. This is sort of tangential to this issue. And it's one, um, it's one that I think, uh, is not something that a lot of people pay attention to. Like we may, we may have discussed it on this podcast before. Um, did either of you see the Census Bureau population growth numbers for 2021? Was it like 0.1% or something? 0.1% is the lowest rate of uh, population growth since the founding of the nation. We, uh, we are facing a severe worker crisis, worker shortage right now. There's not, I mean, <clears throat> out here where I live, there is not one place that has... Um, that does not have a help wanted sign up. It's mm -hmm. it's like and it's like that no matter where I go. Yeah. And I get I get wanting to to ensure that only citizens can vote. Uh and I understand that but Scott, you're saying this is a proactive thing. Sure. I understand. Doesn't seem to be a problem in Georgia because nobody's decided a specific instance of this happening in Georgia. Uh we've cited instances of it happening in Maryland and California. Uh but not Georgia and Maryland is 700 miles away. California is what 2000 miles away. <clears throat> um, I fail to see the necessity of this other than picking on Brown people. And, and, and that's, and this Look, is not all, this, this not isn't, all no, let me, immigrants let me, let, are let, Brown. Let, let, let first me, and foremost, let, let me finish, let me finish. But that's where it's, that's where it's associated with the, with conservative movement politics. It's not, they don't care about Canadians coming to the United States. They don't care about Europeans coming no, to the United States. I guarantee you that any Republican in Georgia wouldn't want a Canadian white person voting in an election any more than they'd want a Guatemalan. I, I, and to make the argument otherwise is without proof and unfounded. 
Oh, well, oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Scott. I mean, there's not, there's there, the groups are called, there's a group called pro English. There's a group called there. I mean, you have, uh, you have groups like fair and center for immigration studies. They, they are, they're built on the whole, the whole notion that you want to keep sort of like the euros, the Euro European, um, uh, uh I, ethnicity in the United States. It is, it is fundamentally a, a racial issue. It is. I, I recognize that those groups exist and I, and I find them repugnant. And yet I can see the value in making sure that elections are for American citizens. And I, I don't, don't, I don't disagree with this, with it being about with, with elections being for American citizens. I don't disagree with that. My point is that in a situation like this, where the sole purpose is to, is a messaging opportunity to make some Democrats look bad when the, when a vote comes up, comes to the floor, is to boost the candidacy of a particular candidate. This is why he's running with it. It's going to fail. It's not going to pass. It might, might, might get a vote in the Senate, sure, but it's going to fail. This, this is, this is a, another stupid wedge issue, and I'm tired of it. Sorry. <laughs> the, the, the reality of it is, look, I understand that, that for some, they would see it the, exactly the way that you do, and I don't invalidate it. Uh, that the the groups that you mentioned exist, but they're not the driving factor in a measure like this. Um, are there politics at play? It's an election year. Yeah, silly things happen. But on it on the merits of of the argument, let's just look break it down. Should non American citizens be voting in American elections? That's the question. Put all the other stuff aside. Ask, look at the issue on its own merits regardless of who supports it and who doesn't, because those those groups that you mentioned, I guarantee you are a minority. They might be a vocal minority, but they're a minority within the Republican Party or any other party or organization. They might not even recognize uh, uh, a party affiliation at all. But at the end of the day, you have to ask the question, is it right or is it wrong for non-citizens to be voting in elections in Georgia? And I, I happen to hold the belief that elections should be by citizens. I think also that it makes an incentive for people who are here to become U.S. citizens. And I'm okay with that. But I think I, the, the, pro the problem I've got with it is that it is an election year. It's already against the law in Georgia. As Jason mentioned, nobody can point. There's been attempts and they've come up empty. Nobody can point to a single non-American citizen who cast a ballot in the state of Georgia last year, not they, last year, 20, but there, there are there are examples. Can't do of, it. Not in 2020, but there have so been. So it's, it's a reaction to the stolen election crowd. It's it, I mean, I, the cynical way to look at it is that this is Butch Miller knowing that he's running against Donald Trump's dude in this race and he's got to do something. So what do you do? You try to out Trump the Trump guy. And so you you get at the heart of there was something that the Republicans in, incorrectly believe, and that's that there's millions and millions and millions of, of people streaming across the border to vote, and it's not true. And so, uh, we, again, we, I, you know, if it, if it'll put if it'll put that to bed, if you can promise me that MAGA world will immediately say, okay, now we know that elections are secure, we can go vote. Okay, but no, they won't. They'll they'll be. They'll still claim that Brad Raffensperger me, is seeking these votes. Let me just ask it this way. Should non-citizens be voting in Georgia? No, which is why we have a law against it. Yeah, and that law can be changed by the majority of legislators uh, and signed into law by Democratic every government. Can, but, that, yeah, and, but every law can. So shouldn't everything be in the Constitution then? Well, n not everything, but the, it, you answered my question, and, and I'll ask the same adjacent. Should non-American be allowed to vote in American elections? Uh, in well, you said Georgia was it Georgia elections or well, in Georgia elections? elections. In yeah, Georgia, Georgia, in Georgia yeah. elections. I think it should be up to the jurisdiction. If a city wants to do it, it's up. To, it should be up to the city. If well, cities are cities are a creature of the legislature. They're I a creation I, of the legislature. Sure, sure. I, I don't disagree with you, but I also think I mean, these you know, counter contrary to what some people may believe. These are these people do pay taxes, even even illegal immigrants, people who are non citizens, illegal immigrants. They pay taxes. They pay, uh, you know, they contribute to the to the local community. Uh, it, I think it should be up to on a jurisdictional basis. Should they be, uh, should they vote in statewide elections? No, the legislature has spoken on that already. Uh, should they be able to vote in federal elections? No, they shouldn't be. 
Uh, but I think it's, I think like most issues, this should be something that's decided by, uh, by a municipality or local jurisdiction. That's my two cents. So moving along on, uh, on, on segue, uh, segue, quick, segue. Uh, uh, the devil came down to Georgia. Uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden was here. Oh, uh, come on. You're going to make me defend Joe Biden after that. And, uh, I, 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 Don't call I, the president the devil. I am kidding. I am kidding. It was a joke. It was a joke. <laughs> I'm uh, canceling you, Jason. You, you've already done that with, with the, uh, <laughs> if it, the, the hardcore conservative listeners or viewers that we have, uh, I, I'm sure I'll be getting some hate mail uh tonight so uh <laughs> or, t- or tomorrow um so president joe biden came down here uh came down here to atlanta uh yesterday nobody was paying attention because of uh georgia Bull- no. uh, georgia bulldogs winning the national championship Who planned that i mean that's- <laughs> it was just really really bad timing uh so uh and th- there's a lot of interesting narratives that have come out of this obviously he comes down he came down here to pitch voting rights because the senate is hope uh, it hopes to take that issue up in the coming days uh his plan for it is to uh is to do something related to the filibuster what they want to do is kind of kind of remains to be seen the, the issue that what they're talking about doing is creating a carve out uh for for voting rights legislation um from the filibuster which for those of you for, for who are not familiar uh to do uh there, there's a, a kind of a lengthy process to get a bill to the floor in the senate uh there's a mo- there's a cloture motion on the motion to proceed then there's a motion to proceed which is a, a majority simple majority the cloture motion is a 60 vote threshold and then there's the cloture motion to limit debate which is also a 60 vote threshold and then there's final passage which is simple majority um so they want to create this carve out for that or eliminate the filibuster for legis- uh, legislation uh, in its entirety. Go ahead, Scott. Is that, I mean, you said carve out, meaning it would be a temporary one. Am I understanding that right? That's the goal is it would be, be one time for this issue? Is no, that it, what they're trying it, to say? It, that's not my, my understanding would, would be that the, fil- the legislative filibuster would remain, remain in place for everything but voting rights legislation. So there be, but there's been other carve outs, right? The Supreme Court nominees, for example, are, are carved out, right? Right. So this this started back in 2013 when then Majority right. Leader Harry Lee Harry Reid got uh, got rid of the fil- uh, the filibuster for the uh, executive calendar, which is nom- presidential appointments uh, for every everything but the um, the Supreme Court, mm-hmm. uh, and then because uh, he he wanted uh, he wanted to fill uh, the 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 D.C. Circuit Court with judges, and he also wanted uh, some other nominees, the National Labor Relations Board, if memory serves, uh, to um, uh, to get filled. Um, and then in 2017, with the nomination of Neil Gorsuch, McConnell got rid of the the, the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees. Um, but there has been historically bipartisan support for the legislative filibuster, including Trump, who President Trump, who called for the elimination of the filibuster some two or three dozen times. Uh, but there was enough Republican support. I think 66, 67 um, uh, senators signed a letter to keep it in place, including many Democrats who are now calling to get rid of it. Uh, so that is one one thing, this this carve out. The other thing is to lower the threshold to a simple majority. Uh, they're talking about potentially bringing back the talking filibuster. They're talking about eliminating the motion to proceed on, uh, or the cloture motion on the motion to proceed, which again, is just the first step in the process of bringing a bill to the floor. Uh, so there's or even potentially lowering the the, the threshold from 50, uh, 60 votes to 55 votes. That's another thing I've heard. Uh, but so Biden's calling for them to do that so they can bring one of two bills to the floor, the, one of them being the John Lewis uh, uh, Voting Rights Act. Um, so uh, but the interesting thing that came came out of this. Well, first of all, Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, uh, Joe Manchin, Senator from West Virginia, Kirsten Sinema, Senator from uh, Arizona, both Democrats have said they are not on board with this. Uh, getting rid of the filibuster. Uh, both of them had, had, had others too, right? I mean, uh, you you have guys like Mark Kelly, who's uh, in you know in the swingy state of Arizona. Uh, you've got he's others. On the, who... He's on the fence. He's on the fence. Right. Uh, so so, but uh, and the the things that were coming out of this. So first of all, there are a lot of groups uh, like Black Lives Matter groups, uh, some other prominent activists from uh, who who all oppose SB two hundred two, who were no shows yesterday. They declined to attend. You had some who had reservations about com- coming, including the King family. Um, uh, so, uh, and then most notably, uh, Stacey Abrams, uh, who is the likely Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia, she did not attend. So, 
pretty interesting uh, to see the, the president of the United States come down and he couldn't get his schedule to match up with, uh, with Stacey Abrams. Or anybody from the legislature, for that matter, right? I didn't right. see James Beverly, the minority leader there. Did you? I mean, he could have been. I just missed it. Um, and if he, did, if he did, was there, I'll apologize. But I didn't see really anybody roll out the red carpet for the president of the United States. Now, yeah. I, I will say this, okay? Um, and, I, and I feel like the Democrats got really burned when they started criticizing Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, when he disappeared, quote unquote, for a week. And it turned out he was attending to his wife while she was seeking breast cancer treatment. And, you know, family comes first before any job, even if it's an executive, like a governor's office. So, you know, they were they were completely blitzed the media about, oh, Ron is missing. Ron is missing. Well, Ron was taking care of his family. Right. So I want to believe in the the best case scenario here for Stacey Abrams that maybe she had something intensely personal. It just can't be talked about publicly. But if that's not the case, you just severely embarrass the president of the United States, the leader of your own party in a state where you are running for governor. And what does that actually say? Uh, you know, that is it that Joe Biden's numbers are so bad you don't want to be seen on the same stage with him? Because that's what it seems like to the average viewer. Now, I'm willing to give you that benefit of the doubt, but you're going to have to explain it at some point, I think. Right. Am I it's, wrong? It seems, it seems to me that what was going on here was because the the various activist groups had pretty strong words for Biden. They, they looked at this as a photo op. They said, you know, that they were saying, we don't want you to come down here and have a photo op. We want you to stay up in Washington and get the job done. Now, I mean, that kind of ignores political reality, which gets back to the discussion about the filibuster. But uh, to me, that's that's the likely explanation. Yes, Scott, I, I agree with you. There could be some personal thing that uh, Abrams had to take care of. Probably, it to me, it looks like folks who she needs to support her, she didn't want to anger them. And uh, being there, being present with Biden for the, his photo op, would have angered those groups. Now, you know, she, she, she's, she's playing politics for November, next November, not politics for now. So she'll, uh, she'll, she'll sit this one out and let, let these people be, be mad at Biden and not at her too. The, the thing that I'm finding most interesting is the amount of political capital Democrats are spending on this, knowing that it's going to, knowing that in, in all, all likelihood it's going to fail. Going to fail. <laughs> Inclu well, also in, in, including, including, because, because Build Back Better the Build Back Better Act is, is all much, all but that. Right. I mean, it's because Manchin, Manchin, I mean, Manchin, you saw, I mean, we're going to get to this later, but the you know, 7% inflation in 2021, Manchin said it was very, very troubling. Uh, yep. And, you know, he was the big obstacle on Build Back Better. Uh, you know, he's the big obstacle on this. Uh, so it's not, a, not only is Schumer trying to turn people's attention away from the failed legislative effort on this budget reconciliation bill. And be, to be clear here, out of that entire bill, 2000 something plus pages there's like one one like half like quarter of a page uh section that i'm on board with you know and <laughs> that much really that, is that, that yeah. a new record <laughs> yeah it, it's it's the repeal repeal of the uh the felony drug exclusion for the american opportunity tax uh tax credit, okay which, that, which actually gets his the history of it just a quick quick side note uh, actually comes from georgia uh with the with the felony drug exclusion for the hope scholarship uh oh. so uh but but yeah so you know, I'm otherwise I'm glad that 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 effort failed. Um, yeah. And and so it's a good it's a good attempt to distract your base by saying, oh, well, this has failed. We can't get all these progressive policies in place. Uh, so we're going to turn to this other thing that's going to take your attention on off of it. Uh, and we're going to you know, we're 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 going to try to we're going to try to do this. But they don't have the vote. They actually have fewer votes for that, yeah. uh, you know, and. And you have Republican, and the interesting thing about it is because they tie, they're tying it to January sixth, and I, yeah, I'm pissed off about January sixth too. But it seems where Republicans are going with that is, well, let's let's get the electoral count, uh, electoral uh, vote issues uh, squared away. I think it's the exactly. electoral count act of yeah. like 1888 right. or whatever it is, 1886. Uh, let's let's do something on that. Yep. Uh, there because, could be bipartisan because, support for that. Right, right. There, there absolutely could. And would uh, address the actual, uh, I mean, there was a low risk uh, right. of, of them, of these, uh, in, these rioters being successful on January 6th. 
but it was it was a little more than zero. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if, yeah. if Mike Pence said, if Mike Pence had said, you know what, I think this interesting legal theory that uh, uh, that that Trump's lawyer has brought forward, let's give it a shot. That's I mean, right. Who knows what would have happened then? So and, yeah, and, and McConnell said he's on board with with reforming the Electoral Count Act. Right. Uh, so, you know, so and, Biden, and, Biden, and Schumer have said no deal. That's right. It's, it's, it's instead, it's, they, and I, I guess look, we should point out that Democrats are trying to make, and Biden was. You know, Biden used some really inflammatory language here. If if you are against this, then you are standing with uh, Jefferson Davis and Bull Connor and those sorts of people. Uh, th that's crazy because this this bill, these bills, and Jason, you probably know this better than I do. These bills are essentially Democrat wish lists of every election uh, gimmick that they want to want to do, and it and, and it take it's. It's a takeover of federal in, in all for all intents and purposes of all elections, uh, and when the Constitution is pretty clear that states shall conduct the elections, so this this it's not a a slam dunk. You're either standing with Bull Connor and Jefferson Davis, or you're standing with with Joe Biden. This this that's that's preposterous language that won't. Uh, again, it, it makes me think that he's really just all this really is is just performance for the progressive side of the democratic party uh who, who will continue to be frustrated because it's not going to happen so there was there's something i wanted to get uh get get at real fast and i'm trying to find the uh, specific clause of the uh constitution uh where it talks about where it talks about elections um so yeah so it's article looks like article one section four Mm -hmm. uh, the times, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations, except to the uh, places of choosing senators. Uh, yeah. So, this is something I think a lot of conservative activists uh, misunderstand. It, it, it is is they keep saying it's a federal takeover of elections. There is a lot of truth to that because there are provisions of these bills, particularly before the People Act, that do preempt states, mm -hmm. states like you know res restoration of felon voting rights, which I'm personally on board with. Yeah, uh, let us let us as states figure it out. Well, states, states, some states are never going to figure it out. I would actually be okay with preemption there, but that's like one of the rare instances of preemption that I'm okay with. Doesn't also ban the the you know uh, bans any state from using photo ID. That's right. Elections. Now that form of preemption, I'm not okay with. Uh, right. But so, so the 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 it, it is it is one thing to say that Congress is coming in and and dictating to states how they must conduct state elections, mm -hmm. but Congress has an avenue where they can dictate and regulate a, a state when it comes to a federal election because the Constitution yeah. specifically prescribes that. And that, and the, uh, you're right, and that means that the presence of a single federal candidate on the ballot means that federal law kicks in. Okay, so. that's correct. Yeah, uh, Scott, did you want to do you want to add anything? No, I, I I have long advocated for several different aspects of election reform. One is I want elections to be secure. I want them to be verifiable. Uh, I want to be able to go back and be able to check the results through audits. Uh, specifically risk living audits is what I've advocated for in the past and will continue to. Uh, I also want to maximize participation and I want to make it um, a as quick and easy and painless as possible. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to elections reformers, I, I think the these bills have missed the mark. And, and, I, and I think that they've missed the, uh, for political purposes, the president has mischaracterized what the Georgia legislature has done to a great degree. And the media continues to echo him by calling it the Georgia's restrictive WSB radio today on my way into the Capitol. I uh, believe he, Biden also re reiterated this is Jim Crow on steroids, right? Well, they referred to it as Georgia's restrictive voting law. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, and Joe Biden, the President Biden's in town um, to address Georgia's restrictive voting law, I think was how it was, was worded by the guy reading the script that had been given to him from somewhere. <laughs> the bottom line, though, is that the governor's uh, talking point on this is that SB202 makes it easy to vote and hard to cheat. And the facts are backing him up on that. You know, that we did not see six hour long wait lines under SB202 in the last election. 
we, uh, we, we did not see mass confusion. We did not see any of the COVID driven types of delays that had, had plagued the, the system when the new voting machines and um, we're, we're seeing it where more and more people are voting in every election. Yeah. So participation continues to increase, not decrease under these laws and, and regulations. So they, the criticism is missing the mark. It's just not based in fact. It just sounds really good to froth people up and try to make a boogeyman out of the Republicans. They're coming for your right to vote. That's not the case. And, and I'm a Republican. I'm one of the most conservative Republicans I know. And I want these things. I want them to be secure and verifiable and cheap to run. And I, and I, and I think that all of these things together is where the Republican voting uh, legislation that we've seen thus far passed in the law has kind of gone. And I, and I, I got to say, I, I think it's been the results speak for themselves. And I think we should also point out, you, Yuval Levin had a, a great article the other day that making the point that both parties or elements of both parties are acting in a way that undermines our our faith in the elections. Yes, absolutely. Uh, with, yes. With, with of course, we, we've talked ad nauseum about the stop the steal movement. We've talked a lot about Stacey Abrams uh, still to this day, not you know, making the claim that suppression uh, you know, caused her to lose the election. Uh, neither of those things are true. And Democrats continue to do that. All, most of the conversation around these these two bills that the Democrats are pushing is just right in line with that. It's, an, it's, it's the Democratic narrative of why you can't trust the elections unless we win. And that, that is, it, with all this talk that Democrats are talking about, about this grave threat to democracy that we face right now, they're, they're contributing to that too with this kind of language Amen. That, Amen. Uh, that elections are, are not trustworthy and, uh, and, and are, are suspect unless they win. Well, it was, it, it was, it was, I mean, you remember back, you know, during 2017, it was Republicans want to take away your health care and people will die because of this. Yeah. Uh, when it was the, when it was tax cuts, people will die because of the tax cuts. When it was, yeah. the when it was the repeal of title two regulation of inter the internet, otherwise known as net right. neutrality, you know, people yes. are going to die because of this. And it's like, I've died so many times at this point. I don't know how many more times I can die, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, and it's, I mean, it's 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 that sort of toxicity you see in our politics today, and we, we talk a lot about Republicans, but every you know we view we've 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 gone to viewing every every legislative change uh, as as this existential threat to democracy, you know, right. and and it's and look, you know, people who've listened to this podcast, we're we're I think we're well into our you know into the forties and number of episodes we've done, um, know how pissed off I was about January sixth, you know, um. I'm and, still mad about it. Yeah, it was, still, it was a yeah. stain. It was an embarrassment. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and but it, at the same time, it's like we we've got to we've got to stop walking walking. We got to start. Excuse me. We got to start walking back this sort of apocalyptic view of politics because it's 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 making us. Hate. I mean, Eric Eric Erickson talks about it all the time. We treat politics as religion now, and it's yeah. it's, it's it's you know it's which which political tribe do you identify as your as your religion. Yeah. And it's it's getting old and boring. It's stale, and I'm tired. I'm just really tired of it. Um, yeah, I mean, that, I think that that does more to turn people off. Why don't you know? There, there are there are people who don't vote because they say I'm sick and tired of both parties. I'm that and close. They, I'm uh, that close, guys. Yeah, I'm that close. You know, yeah. I I mean, I am that close. And the, one other thing I'll I'll add in terms of of eliminating the legislative filibuster is, um, you know, turnabout's fair play. You know, uh, and. It, I, you know, not only is McConnell threatening to gum up the works in the Senate by bringing a bunch of legislation to put Democrats in tough spots. Got to read uh, his quote when, you, yeah. when you're done. So. But but, uh, you know, it's it's next time Republicans have control of government, of all branches of government, you know, they're going to be able to ram through things that they want to ram through. Now with. you sound like Mitt Romney, Jason. Congratulations. <laughs> you and Mitt. Who knew you were that close together? I, I, I mean, I'll, well, this is the this is the inevitable consequence of, of getting rid of the filibuster. There was right. there was one there was um, he's not a he's a he's a member of the House. There's one member of the House when when Trump was talking about this back in 2017, 2018, um, getting rid of the filibuster, uh, who who was just like visibly angry uh, about it because there are some Republicans, some conservative Republicans who wanted to get rid of a fil rid of the filibuster. I think even Ted Cruz floated the idea at one point. In time. Uh, but he's just like, that's the one thing standing between us and socialism. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, McConnell's quote was was, you know, he doesn't normally get into this kind of language. He, but he says if 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 you do this, it will quote silence the voices of millions and millions of Americans represented by its senators, GOP senators. We will make their voices heard in this chamber in ways that are more inconvenient for the majority in this White House than anybody has seen in living memory. I assure you, it would not be more efficient or more productive. I personally guarantee it. Cocaine Mitch. Cocaine, Cocaine Mitch, Mitch is back. Cocaine Mitch. Cocaine Mitch. <laughs> fear, the t- fear the turtle. Um, so I, I, I mentioned earlier today, or earlier today, earlier on the podcast, uh, that uh, inflation in 2021 hit 7%. It's the highest it's been since 1982, the year after the last time the Georgia Bulldogs won the national championship. I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I was all of a, uh, a, year, a year, correlation is not necessarily old. causation, right? <laughs> I was a little over, a little older than a year at that point in time, not quite two years old. Uh, but uh, Bloomberg uh, News had a had an interesting story today. Uh, that inflation uh, has been, you know, been hitting some parts of the country worse than others. Um, and the one place it's hitting uh, particularly worse than anywhere else in the country, with the exception of Phoenix, which is who is, who is right behind us, is Atlanta. Atlanta inflation uh, in 2021 was 9.8%. Phoenix just behind us at 9.7%. So you break Joe Biden's, President Biden's coming down here to talk about voting rights uh, and, you know, eliminating the filibuster and, coming to Atlanta to, to talk about it. Uh, he, his administration has been ignoring the warning signs about inflation literally all of all of 2021. And I think, he's, yeah. I think I figured out why Stacy didn't come. She couldn't afford the gas money to get to the venue. <laughs> that's it. Uh, right? Yeah. No, no, wait, wait, that's not it because she's making millions of dollars off her, her grift. Never mind. She could definitely afford it. No, this is this this is the this is the quote from uh, from uh, the the story and the the statistics here come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, in Atlanta, which has been uh, at or near the top of the monthly consumer price index in recent months. Transportation costs rose twenty nine point three percent, and apparel costs climbed fourteen point two percent, both significantly higher than the average for U.S. cities, up to twenty one point one percent and five point eight percent respectively. Uh, Atlanta being, or Atlanta, uh, Metro Atlanta is half the state's population, but Georgia being a, a crucial swing state uh, with uh, Senator Raphael Warnock up for re-election facing potentially Herschel Walker or uh, you know, maybe one of the other Republican candidates for, for U.S. Senate. Uh, you know, then you have at least, you know, at least one toss-up uh, district for Congress, Sanford Bishop. His race is rated lean Democratic, and you have obviously Georgia 6, uh, which is likely going to go a Republican, mm-hmm. it kind of, it, 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 you know, it, it kind of makes you wonder what, what the hell they're thinking. So. Well, I can tell you, I, I'm feeling the inflation pain. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 I go grocery shopping now and my, my grocery bill buying the same items is noticeably higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, that budget item has, has basically skyrocketed in our house. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wish we could do something to rein in those costs. I don't want to see an Elizabeth Warren style <laughs> breakup of Kroger, uh, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. I think it's very convenient for her to pick on Kroger since there are no Krogers in Massachusetts, but <laughs> inflation is very real. And the 10% that you, you know, 9.8, I'm going to ground it up to 10. It's, it's brutal. It's brutal. It's like a 10% pay cut yep. right now for those of us who live in the Metro Atlanta area. Yeah, so we inflation rose by seven percent, but wages grew by three percent, which effectively means wages were cut. Wages, yeah. yeah, I've, I, well, my wages didn't go up. I mean, my, my, mine my, remained the same, and mine remained the same. the same for this year, which yeah. means every time inflation goes up a little bit more, I, I'm essentially bringing home less. You know, yeah. my buying power is is diminishing. This is a real problem for the Democrats heading into the midterms. You know, they're they're they should honestly be thanking Joe Manchin and Senator Cinema every single day for saving them from themselves, because if yes. they pump more money into this economy, it's only going to to exasperate the, this. Problem. The the tax increases the tax increases, and I'm not advocating for tax increases by saying this. The tax increases would have helped to some degree, but it probably would have likely offset the inflationary uh, uh, impact of the Build Back Better Act. And a lot of uh, economists were talking about how it would have cost jobs. Yeah. So, yeah. And well, and, and but see, but now you're in a, you're in a, a situation where so uh, the Fed is 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 scaling back its its purchases of bonds. 
you have uh, you're looking at an interest rate uh, hike, which to, to three sort of three of them next this year. That's right. Uh, to to combat inflation, which means borrowing costs are going to go up, uh, which guess what? That also means interest on the national debt is going to go up too. Uh, the costs associated with servicing that debt. So federal spending is going to go up as a, as a result of this. Um, part of me, part of me really starting to wonder if, if we're if we're going to be slowly inching into a recession this year. I mean, it could be. I mean, I think, you know. But how do you fix it if you've already if you've already pressed all the buttons and pulled all the levers, the Keynesian economic levers that keep the economy and the and the pump primed? Yeah. You've already done all those things and it's created the inflation. So how do you avoid the recession you know, at this point? Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, well, you, Pain. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we have to take our, our lumps, take our medicine. I mean, that's you, you look back. I mean, that's what. You, know, you mentioned 1982. That was coming out of the Carter years, where where and Reagan said these are the things we've got to do. We've got to get government spending under control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fourteen uh, you know, percent interest rate on a car loan. The supply side, uh, you know, economic theories. It was a painful year, but you came out of it, and you were much better on the other end. And I think what we've tried to do since really since the Great Recession is to avoid that pain, and it's just, you know, we, we're looking at. 10 years of, of uh, in, you know, except for the pre-COVID moments, uh, you know, slower economic growth than we'd had in, in previous years and, and lots and lots and lots of government spending. And then added to that supply, supply chain issues, which are still, I mean, there, uh, how many of yeah. you have seen pictures on Twitter or Facebook of, of grocery stores almost completely cleaned out? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so that, that's, that's an added issue. I mentioned the worker shortage earlier. That's an added issue. People keep talking, well, we're at 3.9% unemployment. It's like, yeah, but there's like a million and a half workers who, who are missing right now. The labor, it's actually, the, yeah, it's actually three and a half million. Okay. If you sorry, look yeah. at the labor force participation rate, uh, uh, it, 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 we're, so we're talking about three and a half million people who have not returned to the workforce for one reason or another. Well, I was gonna, I was going to mention the labor force participation participation rate. I'm glad you did because it, you know it still hasn't it has not come close to recovering from from the pre pre COVID era. But here's the thing, you know, you had when we had the Great Recession, labor force particip participation went down. And it never really recovered from that. And labor, no, force, true. labor force participation has been steadily declining since about April of 2000. So it's yeah. not getting any better. And you know, long-term trend is, uh, I think, at over the next 30 years, few, I think it's going to be less than 60%. Uh, we'll have a, a labor force participation rate of less than 60%, which, which is going back. The, the, you'd have to go back to the 60s to find a labor yeah. force participation rate that low. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's problematic for sure. Um, Look, I think if you're a, if you know talking about this from a political standpoint, if you're a, a politician that's running for re-election this year, you you want to set the narrative, you want to tell the voters what what you want, you know what you think is important and what you want them to be to care about. We're heading into an election where the voters are going to be telling the politicians what they think is important and what they and it's going to be these kinds of things that Scott mentioned. My grocery bill is up. My gas prices are up. I'm not getting a raise to, you know, that helps me keep up with that, and I'm worse off now than I was when when you jokers got into office. I'm voting your butts out. Kitchen and table that, issues. You know, kitchen yeah. table. Kitchen table issues. They they uh, trump everything else. Yep. Scott, you got anything you want to add before I? No, before I, I I think I've said what I need to. Thank you. Uh, so this weekend, this is the last thing I got before we go. This weekend, we're looking at snow or ice or both or or oh. winter winter wintery mix uh, or maybe snow. not. French toast galore, because <laughs> that's what you do when you buy milk, eggs, and bread, right? <laughs> you can find them, yeah. <laughs> All I, I, I will say this. I got a new puppy. Oh, yeah, pictures are adorable. Oh, yes. dog, a dog is. is adorable. Yeah. Uh, check me out on Facebook. I've been posting, and I've uh, got a couple on my Instagram as well, Rep Scott. But here's the bottom line. The, the type of dog I got is Bernie's Mountain Dogs. It loves snow. So for his sake, I hope it just <laughs> piles up because I don't have to be, actually be anywhere other than my home office next week. And I can do all my work from here. And I just want to see this puppy dog playing in the snow so I can go viral <laughs> on TikTok or something. I, all I could say is after uh, after spending a week in D.C. last week where we got eight inches uh, out in, out where I stay in Reston, Virginia, I, I don't want to see snow for another couple of years. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> all I could say, I, I I'm I'm going I'm going to the store on Friday just to just to beat the uh, the last minute rush Saturday night. So uh, because I mean I buy groceries on a weekly basis anyway. So yeah, fun 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 times. Uh, that's all I got, guys. You got anything else to to send us out? 
No, say it, Buzz. Say it. The say crisis. It. The crisis continues. No, say the actual words, Buzz. Go dogs. Not gonna happen. Okay. Well, I tried. I tried. Dog Nation. I tried. I love my friends. I'm glad they're happy. That's that's as good as it gets for me. <laughs> uh, I'll have everyone know that David Perdue is a graduate of Georgia Tech, which is which is just awful. That's true. He is. Yeah. yeah. But we know who Buzz favors in the governor's race. <laughs> I'm no. kidding, Buzz. That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> look at scott <laughs> for for those of you who are listening and not watching scott scott's just got this look of like what just happened <laughs> that was, i was teasing I was if teasing. i were you buzz i'd be texting the governor immediately he knows where i stand, <laughs> he knows where I stand. yeah <laughs> that's all we got guys uh thanks for listening thanks for playing along have a good rest of your week we'll see you next wednesday peace out later see guys ya.